I've had a lot of people ask me, how do you kill so many deer with a bow? Well, there's no short answer. So I decided to put together some videos to show people exactly what I do. I don't claim to be an expert. That would insinuate that I knew everything about bow hunting, and I don't. I read articles, I watch videos, because you never know when you might pick up that one little piece of the puzzle that'd make a difference in your next hunt. Anybody can go out with a gun and occasionally get lucky and kill a deer. Bow hunting's a lot more challenging, but by learning more about the deer and their habits and working hard, you can take the luck out of the equation. By watching the videos and doing everything that I do, you will consistently kill a lot of deer, or at least have the opportunity to. Now in this video, I'm gonna show you one of the most important factors in my success, and I'm gonna show you how it's legally possible that I've killed that many deer. So let's get on with it. I started jotting down notes in preparation to do these videos, and I realized that I tend to go off on tangents. Just bear with me because everything I tell you is important. It's kind of like a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. And hopefully, by the end of this series, you'll be able to see the big picture. Now deer, they're kind of like people in that some are smarter than others, and some have been educated more. The most important thing is to never underestimate the intelligence of a deer. They're a lot smarter than people give them credit for. Several years ago, when I started running more than two cameras, I found that I wasn't able to keep track of what deer was moving where at what time in my head. So I got some graph paper and I started charting the movement at each of my stands. After a couple weeks, I was blown away by how much more I understood about what the deer were doing at each of my stands. Now, the longer I charted, the more I understood about them. Uh, not only was I seeing obvious patterns, but I was seeing subtle patterns, like what are the deer doing at this stand on days when it rains? What are the deer doing at this stand on really windy days? You'll be able to start picking up on those kinds of patterns as well, and that helps you predict what the deer are gonna do next. But one of the most important things about charting, it, it allowed me to know if I was effective hunting or not. So let's say I've got deer coming in three out of the four days at, in the evening time. Then I go in there and I don't see a deer. Then I've probably done something to spook the deer. Now, goes on for another four days, three out of those four days, the deer are in there before dark. I go in and hunt it and I didn't see a deer then it's almost guaranteed that I did something to mess up. Somehow, I spoke those deer without, maybe even without knowing it. So this is how I've been able to learn what to do and what not to do, because I can judge how effective I am at getting into the stand and getting a shot at the deer. All right, charting your movements is real easy. Uh, you can actually download this chart from brentsoutdoors.com. It doesn't cost you anything. I copied it so that the dates are not on here, so I can write down whatever date I want. Uh, say if I want to start on the 15th, I can do 15, 16, 17, so on. Uh, 24 hours in the day. So let's say I'm looking at my cards, and I've got a doe comes in at 6 o'clock. I just put a doe here. At 7 o'clock, maybe a 6 point comes in. I'll put a 6 there. At 8 o'clock, let's say a big 8 point comes in. I'll put an 8, and then I'll put a circle around it so that I can, that will stand out to me, and I can just at a glance see where the big deer are coming in. So now I've got some actual charts here that uh, I saved from last year. Uh, this particular stand, there's not a lot of movement here. There is a pretty good eight point that's coming in occasionally. So I would keep this stand active because you can, you never know when their patterns will change a little bit. The food sources dry up in one spot or whatever, and maybe they'll start moving in the daytime. So, you know, keep this active, keep an eye on it, but I've, I'm not going to hunt this as sparse as it is. Now this stand, 
Uh, lots of nighttime movement. I put lines on the approximate daytime and uh, daylight and dark here, so it makes it a little easier to see what your daytime movement is. Now, I had good movement in here in the evenings. One evening, the first evening I tried to hunt this, got in there and it was damp. Um, I, the deer came in behind me. I didn't expect them there. Um, I moved to scratch my nose or something and they just blew out everywhere. They, they just blew out. I, I spooked them, educated them good. They never came back in when I was there. I know in my mind that they was circling around downwind every time after that to make sure that there wasn't something stinky up in a tree there. So, but they kept coming in the evenings, but when I would hunt this, I didn't see them. So one little mistake, and I burned this stand as far as being able to kill a deer there. So this is, this is just one of the reasons why everything is so important. Okay, at this particular stand, I had a seven point, a eight point, a nine point, a six point, and some smaller bucks and does using this real regular. The, the mainly the does and spikes in the daytime. Little few bucks showed up during the morning there, but not enough to really focus on. Um, so I took a couple of does out here, and then the next month I didn't have near as much activity, but. Uh, this eight point decided that he was going to work this in the daytime then. And so this particular day, he, he was there every single hour during those times. And I happened to check my card that night. So the next morning I came in and I was in my stand an hour before it got daylight. And I sat there and these does came in and I just sat there and watched them and let them walk. And then at four o'clock, this buck came back and I killed him. Uh, on this stand, I had a couple of six points coming in. They uh, they were using pretty regular at night and then pretty good in the evening. But they, they wasn't very impressive, so I just kind of waiting. And, and then when I decided to finally start hunting the bigger of the six points, he decided to leave the country, I guess. He just stopped showing up. So that's just part of hunting. Now at this particular stand, uh, they, I had five does working this and they were there just almost constantly. Uh, went in one evening here to go ahead and take another doe and a five point just from just randomly walked through. I was able to kill him and while I was waiting on him to giving him some time as a spike came in and I got it too. So this is just some examples of what the charting looks like. And understand that regardless of how many stands you have, they're all going to be unique. Every, there, none of them are going to be the same because the deer at each stand are different. They will move differently at different times of the year. And so their patterns are constantly changing. But by charting your movement like this, you can keep track of them. I usually have 10 to 12 cameras out at any given time. And I'll chart my movement two to three times a week. And once I get it charted, then I can set aside any charts that don't have consistent daytime movement and just focus on the ones that do. Now, if a buck's coming in and he's not real regular, but he's been coming in some in the evening, I may opt to hunt that, even though there's a lower chance of getting a deer than over here at this other stand where it's a, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to kill a doe. But you have that option that way. Now, I check my cards either in the middle of the day or at night, uh, because I don't want to disturb the deer if they're in there when I would be hunting. You know, usually in the middle of the day, you're pretty safe, uh, except for some stands, and you'll know which ones those are. And at night, now a lot of people are afraid to spook the deer at night. I can't tell you how many times I've had pictures, two to three minutes before I got there, and then, uh, check the card, then the next time I go check the card, that same deer will be back within that same hour time frame. When you check your cards, you want to walk in hard and fast, get in and out as quick as possible. If you happen to see a deer when you're walking in, just ignore it and walk on by. Don't look in its direction, don't stop, because if you 
just blow on by. The deer's just standing there thinking, well, that's just another dumb human tromping through the woods. But now if you sneak in and try to slip into your stand, then you're looking like a predator. So they're gonna perceive you as a threat. And the next time they come through that area, they may be a little more cautious about coming in. Now I wanna talk a little bit about nighttime bucks. Facebook and Twitter is loaded up with pictures of big bucks coming in at night. And I like to see them too. I like to know that they're in the area. But if they're coming in between like 10 o'clock at night and three o'clock in the morning, then they're probably a long way from your stand during daylight hours. So just because you're seeing them at night, don't mean that they're magically gonna appear when you show up there. Now the only exception to that is they're in the rut and they can, they can be anywhere at any time. There's no rhyme or reason to them during that time. But what I look for is when you start seeing that movement trending either towards morning movement or towards evening movement, because their patterns will change throughout the season. So if you if you're coming in at 10 o'clock and then the next night it's at 9:30 and the next night 8:30, then it's trending more towards evening hours. So keep an eye on that. Keep a close eye because it may be that he'll come in just before dark and in, in another two or three days. So keep that in mind. Um, moon phases. There's a lot of chatter about moon phases and moon charts and all this business. Um, for a couple of years, I tried to correlate the movement that I saw with the moon charts. I couldn't see that there was any correlation at all with my movement. Now, they may be somewhere else, but if they're not moving at your stand, what difference does it make? And when you're charting the movement at your stand, then you have the best data available. When you start killing a lot of deer, it's only natural to want to video your hunts. Now, I started out with the camera arm. It was a pain to pack in and set up and kind of got in my way. And anyway, it's just more trouble than it's worth. Then I tried a bow mounted camera, uh, a lot of different issues with that, but the main problem was is a shaky video. And what I wanted to be able to do is to see where the arrow hit the deer so I would know how long I needed to sit there before I started tracking. Um, Try to GoPro, of course, it doesn't zoom in enough to be able to see anything right then. So out of frustration, I designed a cap mount. It just attaches to your favorite ball cap. When you're wearing it, you won't even know it's up there. When a deer comes in, just go to video, zoom in to whatever level you need, and put it on the mount. Now you're recording your hunt. I've got a couple of video clips here that I'm gonna show you. Uh, you can go to catmount.com and see dozens more videos and order yours today. Uh, with shipping, it's 25 bucks. So you'll be able to record your hunt for 25 bucks. You're not gonna beat that anymore. Okay, the next section of this video is not going to be very exciting, but I feel like that I need to explain how it is legally possible that I've averaged over 20 deer a year over the last eight years with my bow. If I don't explain this, then there's going to be a bunch of people out there calling me a poacher, saying I'm a game hog, whatever. And, you know, what I want to do is get this out of the way, and then we can focus on the information that's gonna put deer in the back of your truck. Eight years ago, the city of Fairfield Bay, Arkansas 
was overrun with deer. They were having a lot of problems with people hitting deer with their cars. Nobody could raise anything in their yard because everything was being eaten. Um, the vegetation, anything under about six foot tall was gone. Anything that they could reach standing up on their back legs was devoured. The deer were poor and in bad shape. And so the city decided to have an urban hunt. And if you qualified in, for the urban hunt, you were issued unlimited either sex tags. So I've been participating in this urban hunt for the past eight years. Now the first couple of years, there was a lot of deer and it was pretty easy to kill deer. Um, the second year I actually killed 32 deer over there. Um, but after that second year of the hunt, what deer were left were pretty well educated and there was not nearly as many deer. Now, every year there's between one and 200 people that are issued permits to hunt this urban hunt. And all of them have the opportunity to kill as many either sex deer as they want. Okay, you can see the city of Fairfield Bay outlined in red. Um, a total of about 15 square miles. Uh, about half of this is off limits to hunting. So I'm gonna zoom in and show you the section that I do most of my hunting. It's the northern section here. So you get a little bit better idea of what, what I have to work with. So you see all these roads in here. This was subdivided at one time, um, but never got developed. As you see, there's not any houses out in this area. So I'm not shooting them out of somebody's backyard. All right, now that you've seen the area that I have to hunt, imagine a hundred people scattered over half of that area. And it kind of give you an idea of the hunting pressure that these deer have had. Now the third year of the hunt, I only killed 13 deer and I didn't kill a single deer after the leaves fell off because those deer, the deer that were left, they were walking around looking up in the trees. If they saw anything abnormal, they went somewhere else. So I really had to step up my game to be able to take these deer, especially after the leaves fell off. Now, over the course of the hunt, I've taken over 20% of the total kill of this hunt. Now I say this not to brag, but if I'm gonna listen to somebody explain how to do something, I wanna know that they actually know what they're talking about. Several years ago, I read this article in a prominent magazine, and it was about late season whitetails. And the author went through all these steps of what you do to, to kill a late season buck. At the end of the article, he actually said, I've actually never killed a late season buck, but this is how I would do it if I were gonna hunt late season deer. I was just blown away that somebody would get out there and write an article and be published in a, and they didn't have a clue of what they were talking about. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot more information out there that's not solid that's that's based on uh, uh, reading articles from here and there and somewhere else and just kind of putting it together and so they can sound like some kind of expert but the information that i'm giving you here is stuff that i have done i'm not going to say anything that i haven't done or i thought would work anything like that Everything that I tell you in this video and the, the following videos are things that I have done and I've proven that work by my charting. You know, I, they're effective or I wouldn't have killed deer. People ask me, why do you kill so many deer? Why don't you just let some of them walk? Well, I love to hunt. And I'm in a unique situation where I'm helping the city of Fairfield Bay control their deer herd and I'm also able to help a lot of people by putting food on their table. Now I give deer each year to the Hunters Feeding the Hungry program, 
But most of the deer that I kill, I give to people that are actually struggling financially. I'm a registered nurse. I work in the emergency room in Clinton, Arkansas. And I work three twelves. I'm off three days, work three more, and I'm off for five. So I have a lot of time to chase whitetails. Now, the next video, we're going to talk about stand site location. We're going to look at some aerial photographs, and then we're going to go to two different sites, one over in Fairfield Bay that's already established that I kill deer at almost every year. And then I've got permission to hunt a new piece of property. And so we're going to go in there and I'm going to show you all the factors that I look for in a stand site location. Now, if I don't find almost all of those factors in this spot, then I'm going to keep on until I find a spot that has everything. And then this fall, I'm going to show you a video of me killing deer at that spot. That sounded a little arrogant. It's really not arrogance though, it's confidence. Because I know if I put all these pieces together, then I kill deer. And when you learn all of the things that I'm going to show you, you'll be killing deer too. Well, that's it for this video. Be sure and hit the subscribe button so you'll be notified when the next one comes out. If you've got any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. Till then, have a good one.